This is Speaking Freely with the ACLU of Pennsylvania. I'm Andy Hoover, your host and Director of Communications at the ACLU of PA. This is a very special episode of Speaking Freely. On April 28th, the United States Supreme Court heard just the fifth student speech case in its history. It's a case from Pennsylvania, BLV Ma'anoi Area School District, and it's a case in which the plaintiff is represented by the ACLU of Pennsylvania and National ACLU. The plaintiff is identified in court documents as BL because she was a minor at the time, but BL is Brandy Levy, a 2020 graduate of Ma'anoi Area. In this episode, you'll hear from Brandy along with another special guest, Mary Beth Tinker, who was one of the plaintiffs in the seminal Supreme Court case, Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District. We'll hear from Brandy and Mary Beth about their experiences as students whose speech was deemed punishable by their schools. ACLUPA Legal Director Vic Walchek also joins the conversation to explain the rights that are at stake in this case. And you'll briefly hear from Brandy's father, Larry Levy, who talks about how the family tried to resolve the issue and then decided to contact the ACLU. Well, this is an all-star panel to be sure, talking about free speech. Thank you, Mary Beth and Vic and Brandy. It's great to have all three of you here. And Mary Beth and Brandy, I understand you two have not met before, so this is fun and exciting. Yes, it's very exciting. I'm so glad to be here with all of you, with Brandy especially, and Vic great champion of First Amendment. Yeah. So actually, I want to start with Vic. So thank you for saying that, Mary Beth. <laughs> um, I want to get into both of your stories, Brandy, your story and Mary Beth, yours. Um, but Vic, why don't you start just by kind of laying the legal landscape, what we're talking about here in regards to student speech? Yeah, thank, thanks, Andy. And Mary Beth, thanks. The check's in the mail for those nice words. <laughs> so just uh, that was perfect the way you handled that. So um, uh, Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District was the first and probably still most important student free speech case, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1969. And in that case, and, I, and I'm not going to talk about the facts. I'm going to let Mary Beth talk about those in, in a little bit. But in that case, the court famously said that students don't shed their free speech rights at the schoolhouse gate. But then they went on to say, but they do give up some rights and they, they give them up basically so schools can function, can operate, can, you know, so they can provide a suitable learning environment. And they said that schools can discipline students if their speech causes a material and substantial disruption or invades the rights of others. Now that's not a standard that applies in everyday society. That is a watered down standard that is applied inside the schools. And since 1969, which if my math is right is more than 50 years, the Supreme Court has only decided three other student speech cases. Um, and, and those have kind of whittled away at the Tinker decision, but its essential ruling remains in place. And just to give folks a quick overview of, of those three cases, um, one of them essentially said that schools can regulate students' use of lewd and vulgar speech, even when there's no disruption. So like no F-bombs in school, even if, you know, nobody would be upset about it. The second case said that schools can censor what students write in a school newspaper or when they're speaking on behalf of the school. And in the, th the, the third case, which is probably the oddest case, the, the Supreme Court said that schools can forbid pro-drug speech when they upheld the discipline of a student who had held up a banner um, out in front of the school saying, bong hits for Jesus nobody still knows exactly what that means. So the, and, and that case was decided in, in 2007. So the Supreme Court has not decided a student speech case in 14 years until probably June in the case that we're talking about now and joining the pantheon of famous cases, Tinker, Fraser, Hazelwood, uh, Morris versus Frederick will be BL versus Monoy. 
and and that kind of brings us up to date on on what, where we are. Just very briefly for the 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 big issue for for that the court is deciding is whether this tinker standard, right, the one material and substantial disruption that they apply in school can be pushed outside of school to off campus. So that if students say anything when they're on their own time, even at a convenience store on a Saturday afternoon far from school, can the school punish the student for saying something that they don't like, something that they think is going to cause a substantial material disruption. So it, it is actually a huge deal for young people's free speech rights. So I'll, I'll shut up there, Andy, because um, these folks are much more important than I am. <laughs> well, you just teed it up perfectly. Uh, thanks, Vic, because you're alluding to some of the facts here. So Brandy, let's Let's head over to you. Um, first of all, let's just kind of set the scene. Tell me, tell us about your hometown. What's Monnoy City like? Monnoy, well, it's a it's a quiet town. It's everywhere is coal and mountains. It's a quiet town. Everyone just like stays in like their own bubble. Yeah, geographically, it's about seventy miles or so northeast of Harrisburg. Kind of sits there south of Hazleton and. I guess northwest or, or west of Allentown. Um, and and what about high school sports? Like, is it do people? How do people feel about high school sports? I mean, they they all like it. Football football is one of the major sports here, and everyone's competitive with it. And people come out on Friday nights. They you know in the uh, you know p- pandemic aside, pre pandemic, like it was the thing to do on a Friday night or a Saturday, get out to the game and and hang out. Yeah, every Friday night. Right. So you were a cheerleader. And first of all, actually, when did you start cheerleading? Uh, I started in fifth grade and then I did it in sixth grade and then I skipped seventh and eighth and then my high school. Okay. So the incident that has led us all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, it happened in May of 2017 and you were in ninth grade at the time. So tell us a little bit about what was happening in your life. I was just I was really frustrated with a lot of stuff because I didn't I didn't make varsity. I wasn't put where I wanted to be for softball. So I was just really angry at everything that day. And if folks have not seen Snapchat, do you want to explain briefly how Snapchat works? So I don't know how to explain it. I <laughs> show I, I could show you it off my phone. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um but it's it's a messaging app basically, but it does yeah. it has some functions that may be a little different from a typical text message. Yeah, so like it's it looks just like this, like and then you like you'll just click on that and take a picture, and then like you could type stuff, and then you could, you're able to put it onto like a Snapchat story, where like every all of your friends that you have added on it can see it. And then it'll delete within 24 hours by itself. So you mentioned that, you know, you were, uh, you were frustrated, annoyed about not making the varsity team. You're hanging out with a friend on a weekend and you start using your, your Snapchat app. Tell us, tell us what happened. I was at the store with my friend and I made a post on snap. Well, I took a picture of me and her whipping the finger and I said, F school, F cheer, F softball, F everything. And then I posted it on my story. Right. Except you didn't actually say F. It was the (laughs) the word itself. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say the word. (laughs) That's okay. Uh, I mean, it's a free speech zone, so we wouldn't care, but I I don't mind if you, uh, if you censor yourself here. Um, So just tell us a little bit about like, what do you remember what you were thinking right after you sent it? Did you think anyone would care? I, d- I didn't really think anyone would care very much about it. Because like I yeah. said, it was a small town. Everyone was like friends with everyone. And when did you realize some folks cared about it? When that same week when I got kicked off the team. And how did they, de- what, what was that like? How did they deliver that news? Uh, the one coach called me down to her classroom in the morning I don't remember exactly what day, but they called me down to their classroom in the morning and she had it printed out and she had it sitting on her desk and she showed me it and said that it was disrespectful towards her and she isn't going to tolerate it and that I was suspended off the team for a year. And what did you say? How did you react? 
I just cried and cried and cried. It's rough for a 14 year old, you know, it's something you love and you love to do. And, and then that happens. So what'd you tell your parents? I went down to the office that same, like right after she told me and I went down to the office and I called my dad and I explained it all to his dad or my dad. And then he said he was going to figure things out with it. So why did you all decide to contact the ACLU? What were those conversations like? Do you remember? No, I have no idea. That okay, so I know, I, I, know, I know your dad's sitting right there off camera. Maybe he can uh, kind of slide in and, and explain the, that thinking and why you all decided to contact the ACLU. Hey, Larry. Hey, uh, well, we tried to solve this within the school itself in the initial beginnings of this, um, both at the lower level with just the coaches and the athletic director and superintendent. Uh, we weren't successful at having the decision reversed. So then I went to the school board at uh, a public meeting and again, pled my case and asked for them to reverse the decision, which they declined to do so ultimately in the end. Um, at that point, that's when I reached out to the ACLU for help in this situation. Why did you think that, what, what, what was the thinking? Why did you think you needed to contact the ACLU? Well, I, I knew they were wrong. Um, you know, what had happened didn't happen in school. Um, it didn't happen during any school events. Uh, it, it really had no target whatsoever to the school district itself. And I was kind of aggravated that they went ahead and took the actions that was more of a parental action. It should have been something that we as parents um, can decide what the outcome of the punishment should be and, and not the school district. And Vic, I want to bounce over to you here because uh, this is the point then where your legal team comes in. This is sometimes how we get cases. It's fairly common, actually. We get these phone calls, we get emails, or, or the people fill out a form, um, and we review them and decide whether or not this is a case. So you all see this, and, and what are you all thinking? Yeah, so we, we get probably 5,000 complaints from across Pennsylvania every year, and you know we have to sift through those. And with limited resources, you know, we only end up taking you know, a handful of those. Um, these kind of cases, we call them off-campus student speech cases. Um, we've actually been doing since 1999. Brandy's is the sixth one of these cases that we've done. Um, and, but a few years ago, we had a, a couple of cases that, I mean, big important cases that we also won in the Court of Appeals um, that they tried, the National School Boards Association tried to get the Supreme Court to review. I think a lot of pundits were surprised that the court declined to review it back then. But the law was pretty clear that what the school did here was illegal under Third Circuit law. So we saw this complaint and said, oh, you know, it should be a quick letter and, uh, uh, and Brandy will be good to go. So, you know, we you know, spent maybe a couple hours on a letter, fired off the letter, and much to our surprise, they, they decided to fight us. And so, um, you know, through three levels within the trial court, you know, an emergency injunction, a second emergency injunction, and finally, you know, after doing discovery, getting a decision, and then they took an appeal to the, to the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals, where we also won. And then, you know, to our surprise, they asked the Supreme Court to review it. Um, not so much to at least my surprise, the Supreme Court agreed to hear it because this is an issue that really is crying out for some kind of guidance from from the high court. I mean, just, you know, I mean, what what is what is the school's authority over what students say outside of class outside of school? So, Mary Beth, I want to bring you in here now, uh, and we want to, I would like to hear you talk a little bit about what happened to you when you were in, I guess, even middle school, maybe, uh, is when your case started. But before we get there, I wonder, I, I understand you go around and you do talks. Um, so when you're hearing all of this, and, and what's, what are you thinking? I know you and your brother filed a, a friend of the court brief in this case. So present day, Mary Beth Tinker, what are you thinking as you hear Vic and Brandy talk about this case? Yes, well, it's it's so good to hear the story, Brandy. And I was about the same age as you were when that happened. Now I spend a lot of time speaking with students, teachers, school boards, school board lawyers, everyone about students' rights. 
and the importance of students having their rights and being able to express themselves and weigh in and affect the decisions that affect their lives, the policies that affect their lives, because youth are a discriminated group. They're discriminated against. And you only have to look at various health outcomes and other outcomes, like what group is most likely to live in poverty? Children and teenagers. Mm -hmm. So often they're you know, breathing polluted air, drinking polluted water, um, their school funding is being cut, their cheerleading program is being cut often their sports, their mm -hmm. extracurricular, um, you know, they're, they're being shot. There's a seventh grade, a young black boy who was just shot recently in Chicago. Um, Adam Toledo, I think was his name. And yeah. so the rights of young people, this is an international human rights issue. And in order to thrive and have well-being, young people need to be able to express themselves. That's a natural human drive. Number one, it's good for their health, but it's also good for the society's health for young people to weigh in on the issues of the day and to affect things that affect young people. Because when a society is good for young people, it's good for everybody. Well, so, and that's, oh, uh, yeah. go ahead. That's all. I was. I come at it partly as a nurse, working mostly with children. I was a family nurse practitioner, and then I worked mostly with kids. I was a trauma nurse. I took care of kids that were shot, kids who were in car crashes, and I started realizing, you know, kids don't really have a fair deal in our society. They're told to shut up. They're told not to express their feelings. They're uh, living under very dire conditions a lot of times. There's a lot of homelessness among kids. And then I started putting that together with my experience in the Tinker um, case, the whole situation that I was involved with um, having to do with youth rights in that case. And it, it kind of came together in a way that I could, I, I could tell the story of not only us speaking up, but students all over the country who have spoken up about so many things and still are today and all over the world who are speaking up about things. Well, and that kind of global thinking clearly was in your head when you were a 13 year old and your brothers as well, as you all planned a protest. And this is 1965. And, you know, I don't, I was born after that era. I was actually born the year that U.S. troops withdrew from Vietnam. But my understanding of the history is that, you know, the, the anti war movement in 1965 was pretty small at that point that the u.s had not fully escalated but you can say more about it so tell us about the era tell us about what was happening and kind of what your thinking was you know in, in planning the protest well it was mighty times as i like to tell students one of the students in one of the classes i was in in called called it that and called these times mighty times as well with so much going on I personally had been inspired uh, partly by the Birmingham Children's Crusade in 1963, where almost 2,000 African-American students were arrested for speaking up against racism. And then they were later attacked by white supremacists and their headquarters was bombed. And four little girls were murdered, Cynthia, Addie, May, Carol, and Denise. And they were about the same ages as me and, and my sisters when that bomb went off on September 15th. And so that was my first experience with black armbands when people in Des Moines followed the call of James Baldwin, the writer, and Bayard Rustin, who was a leader in the civil rights, to wear black armbands throughout the country to mourn for the little girls who'd been murdered and to have memorial services. And so that's what we did in Des Moines, Iowa that year. I had just turned 11 years old when we wore black armbands that year, but we didn't wear them to school. And then there were, there were many other things that happened in, in those times. I mean, I think the Birmingham children were sort of the Black Lives Matter then of our, of our time. And then there were other students and young people speaking up, um, students in Freedom Summer, 1964, when three young people were murdered, again, by the Klan, the white supremacists, Mickey Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney. And uh, that summer, my parents went to Mississippi 
to stand wow. with these brave people. And they taught us that you should take action about your values. Don't just talk, talk, talk. If you say that you believe in love and equality, which my parents did, my father was a Methodist preacher and uh, we later got involved with the Quakers, then that's what you should do. You should take action about these things. So that's what happened. But the day that they found the bodies of Cheney, Schwerner and Goodman, August 4th, 1964, the very same day off the coast of Vietnam, a US Navy ship, the, SS, the USS Maddox, claimed it was attacked by the North Vietnamese. And it turns out it hadn't been, but soon after, within days, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed. And so thousands more troops were sent to um, Vietnam that year, 1964. And by the next year, 1965, there had been about 1,000 soldiers killed in Vietnam. But also that was the year of Selma to Montgomery. Right. Malcolm X was killed that year. The Watts riots happened. And so right. there, was, there was so much going on. But we were, us kids were getting sadder and sadder. And that's why I tell kids, there's a lot of feelings that young people have. And that's one of your great strengths. But you have to be able to express those feelings and you should express your feelings. And so we, we decided to express our feelings that Christmas by wearing black armbands to mourn for the dead on both sides of the war and to support a Christmas truce that was being called for by Senator Robert Kennedy. And that was our way of expressing our feelings. So I understand that the school board got wind of your plan and uh, actually tried to preempt what you were going to do. Can you talk a bit about that? The principals heard about the plan because of an article that was written in the school newspaper at Roosevelt High School across town. And it's this whole case and the story has a lot to do with student journalism also, even today actually. But um, so that's how the principals heard about it. So they called a hasty meeting and made a rule then against black armbands, which was very you know, ridiculous because they allowed students to wear black armbands to mourn the death of school spirit. Hmm. So if not enough kids came to the football game or something, or if the team lost, you could wear black armbands then. But to mourn for the death of real people in Vietnam, that was not going to be allowed. Mm -hmm. So there's also a strength that young people have, which is a basic sense of fairness. To say, now, wait a minute, that's not fair. And so I think that's a lot of what motivated us as well. It's feelings combined with examples of people who do something with those feelings and speak up. Like I had the Birmingham children and also our parents were examples for us as well. Well, and to that point, oh, go ahead, Vic. I'm sorry, you know, Mary Beth, I wanted to ask you a question about something that I've been curious about. In the uh, Supreme Court opinion, it it actually says that um, there had been students who were wearing like some Nazi memorabilia, like the Iron Cross before, which the school did not ban. But when they heard that you were going to, you know, wear the black armbands, they decided to ban that. I mean, do you, what do you remember about that? Well, I didn't know they ever banned those things, but um, yeah, one of our lawyers, well, we had the most amazing lawyer, Dan Johnston from the ACLU. And by the way, all the cases that you talked about, Vic, are ACLU cases. Our case and the three after it, and now Brandy's case. Um, but yeah, so our, our lawyer stepped in a school board meeting and said something about, yeah, that if you even, you know, some kids were wearing pins saying down with pants and you know those were allowed and you know so you could express yourself in the school but it just had to be something that the administration agreed with or that they were okay with that was the problem they didn't want the students themselves to be the ones to decide what was important to them and that's why it's a youth rights a human rights issue well that's why this i mean this case is you know it's not just about students it's about authority Right. And it's about how much authority the schools are going to have to tell you what you can and can't say. 
And if they yeah. can tell you that you can't say stuff like that in school, do we really want the court to allow schools that authority to for kids who go to a convenience store on a Saturday afternoon, right? Or exactly. decide to get engaged in a, you know, go to a, a Black Lives Matter protest on a Saturday or go give a fiery sermon at, at, at their church. Right. I mean, that, this, is, this is not the school's business. Yeah, I mean, Brandy was, was reasonably upset. You were upset about not being, you know, put on the cheerleading team. You expressed yourself in a, in, with a common terminology of our culture, <laughs> words of expression and anger. And so, you know, you as a youth, yes, you need to be able to do that for your well being and for your health. And I thought it was very reasonable that you would do such a thing. The answer here may be well, obvious. It's constructive. Go ahead, Vic. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's also, you know, I mean, people may have different views about the use of profanity, but I mean, frankly, you know, this is a constructive way to get rid of emotion. I mean, there's lots of destructive and inappropriate ways to do that. And, you know, if, if you don't give kids any outlet, right, then you're asking for, for, for trouble. So, I mean, I, you know, I just, I find this appalling. Well, and to that point, Brandy, can you, I, this is my understanding is that, you know, this is what you said and how you expressed yourself. Kids are doing this all the time. You know, Vic and Mary Beth and I did too when we were kids, just in a different way. But, you know, I talked to my teenagers and they're like, Not yeah, that's different. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> sorry. I shouldn't speak for you. You're right. Um, all right. But yeah, I mean, from talking to my kids who are teenagers, you know, they talk about how, yeah, that kind of stuff, you see that on Snapchat and other uh, social media all the time. Oh, that's how kids talk nowadays. Yeah. And it's not just the, and just to be clear, it's not just about the profanity, but it's like, I'm expressing myself, how I'm feeling in this moment about this thing. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Mary Beth, I actually wanted to ask you too about your decisions. Well, I mean, it's... Go ahead, Vic. No, I was, I was just going to say, you know, there's a there's a famous um, early 1970s Supreme Court case where it, it's about somebody saying wearing a jacket saying "f the draft" into a courthouse and whether or not that was protected. Um, and, you know, the court pointed out that, that that's a way to show emphasis, to, to show your emotion. So it's, you know, it's one thing to say I'm angry. It's another thing to say I'm effing angry, right? That, that just is a way to emphasize, you know, I'm really, really angry. Mary Beth, what was the, uh, the court process like for you as you went through that? I mean, I can tell from your description of your parents that obviously you were raised with the idea that you stand up for yourself. But I just wonder if you can talk through like, what it was like going through that, I guess, four years of, of litigation. Well, my parents didn't think that, well, my, my father, I should say, didn't think that we should wear the armbands at first because he was pretty conservative in a lot of ways as far as, you know, authority has its place and that the principals have a job to do and it's not so easy for them. But you see, young people have another quality, persuasiveness. And so we said, but dad, wait a minute now, you taught us to speak up for what we believe in and follow our conscience. And he had taken us to the graves of his friends who were killed in World War II. And he said, you must always follow your conscience because if you don't, we could have the Nazis in charge. And they showed by their example. So we put that back to him. We were like, wait a minute now, dad, I thought you taught us to speak up for these things. Well, and Brandy, I want to ask you that question too. You got back on the cheerleading team, thanks to the court rulings and you graduated from high school last year. You're now a freshman in college. Uh, how would you describe these last four years and this whole process? I mean, honestly, for me, it was, it was stressful at some points. It really was. But other than that, I, I, I feel like I did a good thing doing what I did. So like, it was, I wasn't really like upset about like this whole court thing. Like I wasn't really upset about it. More or less happy for myself for sticking up for myself and sticking with it. Yeah. That's right. That's why I ask students all over the country and I speak at schools all over the country and and I was speaking with students at a few today and I would say, well, how did it feel when you went to the 
you know, rally or we went to the school board and complained about the lunches or the styrofoam packaging or whatever. And they said, oh, yeah, it was great. We really loved it. It was great. It's always such a good feeling. That's why I say it's good for it's good for your health when young people for young people to speak up and, and stand up about things. And Brandy, um, how, what do you, what do you think of this now? Like you're at the United States Supreme Court, like how, how are you feeling? What are you thinking about it? I mean, it's, it's now I'm nervous. Like, especially since it's getting closer, I'm a little bit nervous. Right. Yeah. Um, just by chance out of question, had you at all either in high school or in your first year of college, have you studied the Tinker case? Were you, were you aware of this case? We read about it in high school. Did it, it, it's in the history books. Did it affect the way you felt when all this started happening? Did you think about it or remember it at all? It's hard to remember these things. I mean, I kind of did. It was like, yeah. it was a little, there was a little bit there. A little bit. Yeah. So Brandy, I know some other reporters, some reporters have asked you this question. Curious to hear you say a little more about this. Um, what do you think about this whole issue of schools addressing speech that's outside of school time and out on, and off campus? What, what do you, do you think the school should have any power? I feel like the school should have power to an extent. Like if you're sitting there like threat, threatening the school or like saying you're going to like do something, that's where I feel like the school should step in and same with like cyberbullying and stuff. That's when I feel like the school should step in. But the fact that I didn't do that, I didn't threaten, bully, harass anyone. I didn't do any of that. I didn't even specifically target the school. I feel like it shouldn't have been their job and it should have been my parents. And, and Mary Beth, I mentioned that you and your brother have filed a friend of the court brief. What are you hoping the court does here? Well, yes, I'm hoping that the court will affirm the appeals court decision. I mean, as a nurse working with young people, of course, I'm concerned about bullying and cyberbullying and all of that, but the schools have ways to deal with that now. And I've worked as a school nurse. I've been in there with the social workers and the staff at schools when things come up. There are ways to deal with these things. And I think also schools, you know, I go to so many schools where they've come to creative solutions also for dealing with conflict, for dealing with fighting, for dealing with, I mean, you can have, you know, restorative justice, you can have teen courts, there are all kinds of teen programs. I was at a school um, in uh, Wisconsin recently where they had trained 30 students to intervene for issues having to do with student conflict. And so, you know, they learned how to counsel the students and when to refer the problem and all kinds of things like that. So I think uh, some, you know, schools jump to punitive uh, censoring actions when other measures would be more productive, like dialogue, helping students to learn other ways to express feelings that, you know, might not be self, sometimes the expression is self-destructive, et cetera etc. But um, I know there are a lot of administrators, principals, teachers who really agree and who are implementing some of these other ways of doing things and they don't want to restrict the rights of students. When I when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Tinker ruling in Des Moines and some of the Parkland journalists, students came up from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the principal of the school that I was suspended from came and celebrated. We went to high schools, elementary schools, the superintendent of schools, Tom Ahart wrote an op-ed for the Des Moines Register saying, I'm glad we lost that Tinker case <laughs> because we want our students to have a voice. And there are so many, um, you know, administrators and school lawyers around, you know, the country who, who agree with that, who really do want students to ask to have a voice. I was talking to a principal today, um, virtually when in his school, his classes and I asked him how he felt about it. He said they don't want to monitor students' social media account 24 hours a day. Yeah. Well and Vic, um, Brandy's point about threats is well taken. The, what the but my understanding is what the district is asking for in this case goes well beyond that. So can you just explain that and explain why that's so dangerous what they're asking for? And you're on mute by the way. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think everybody agrees, including us, that the schools have to have some power to deal with the most serious problems, right? So threats, violence, bullying, harassment, cheating, right? So even though that may involve speech outside of school, schools you know, need to deal with that. I mean, bullying is, is definitely a, a, a serious problem. Um, and, and our argument is that schools have plenty of authority to be able to do that under existing First Amendment rules without giving them a lot more power. What we're seeing here is that the school district is making this incredible power grab where they want to take you know, this expanded power they have in school and push it out so that it applies to, to young people 24 seven, right? So if, if this happens, it would mean that, that you know, 50 million young people who go to public schools would not have full free speech rights anywhere in their life. And, and the problem with the disruption standard is that, you know, as a, as a kid, I mean, think about Brandy, you can never know when something you say is going to cross some vague line of disruption. Right? I mean, Brandy, you know, and, and, and it's not just whether it's actually disruptive. If the school thinks it might be disruptive, they can censor that. And, and what is disruptive? Anything that is controversial, anything that's unpopular, anything that would criticize the school, you know, anything that would um, point up that there's problems going on, that you've got a culture of racism or sexism or, or bullying or whatever. And, you know, people would talk about that. People would get upset. That is disruption. And the school would have the, the power to punish that, not because they're going to say, oh, well, you know, we don't want to talk about racism. All they have to say is, oh, this was disruptive. And so you can't say that anymore. So the danger of what the school is trying to do is that it is going to suppress just an enormous amount of really important political, religious, cultural speech. And it's going to mean that students never know when what they say is gonna cross that line. And they're always gonna to have to be worried about, oh my God, am I gonna say something that the school's gonna come after me? That, that's just, you know, I think as Mary Beth said, that's just not healthy. It's not healthy for development. It's not healthy for young people. It's not healthy for anybody. I, I have a last question for Brandy, but I wanna go around the Zoom window real quick, just to give all three of you a chance, just to just kind of give some closing thoughts, you know, maybe framing it as, you know, what. If people are listening to this, what do you hope they walk away with? Um, what are some lessons learned? Mary Beth, why don't you go first? I, I hope people walk away with a higher respect for the importance of youth voices and for youth being able to express their feelings on a range of, of things that happen in their lives and on a range of issues that affect their lives. Vic, what about you? So, I, you know, I think people need to appreciate that that these things don't just happen in a in a in a vacuum. They don't just magically arise. They take courageous people like Mary Beth and Brandy um, to to and 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 Brandy's dad, Larry. You know, to to be willing to stand up and fight for their rights. And you know, in both of these cases, it it's taken four years. Uh, you know, Brandy's out of high school. I mean, she, this isn't going to affect her day to day at all. And yet they've persisted with this fight because it's important, not just for them. It's important for everybody. It's important for the 50 million public school students, their parents, the teachers. Um, so, I, you know, it's just I, I, I'd like people to respect and appreciate what Brandy and Mary Beth and all the other champions of liberty over the years have done to fight for everybody's everybody's rights. And Brandy, any th thoughts, final thoughts, lessons learned, anything in particular you would want anybody listening to this to, to know? I just, I want people to realize that it's okay for kids like me and students that were like me to express how they feel online. Because when I was 14, that's how everyone did it. That's how I did it. I felt it was easier to do it that way. So I just want people to realize that it should be okay for the students to express how they feel without getting punished for it. Yeah, I think I heard a reporter ask you one time something like, do you regret it? And I, as I recall, your answer was something along the lines of, I, 
I was a 14 year old kid. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, cut me a break. I think it may have been the <laughs> phrase that you used, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't regret, honestly, I don't regret what I did, but I was a 14 year old kid. I was 14. Right. So I wanted to conclude with this. Um, I was with Brandy and her dad, Larry, over the weekend. They were doing some media interviews. And Brandy, you told me something uh, interesting. Uh, apparently, you have some coworkers at your job uh, that have given you a particular nickname. Can you tell us what the nickname is? Yeah, my nickname is Mary Beth at work. Ah, <laughs> ah, oh, that's good. And it's because they, they made the connection, right? That's the reason. It's not just yeah. a coincidence. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> So. Well, I just want to say it's just been great meeting you, Brandy, and I think you're great to stand up for yourself. And Vic and Andy, I just admire the ACLU on the 101st anniversary <laughs> of the ACLU, and I think it's your Pennsylvania 75th anniversary or so. Um, Depends upon what year you pick. <laughs> well, I just think you're you're doing good work, and I I read your brief, and it's it's really good, Vic and Sarah, the uh, other lawyer, helped to write it, and I just really admire your work, and I'm going to be following this very carefully and encouraging students to think about all the issues that are involved with it and to talk about it as well, because it's not like there's some, you know, adult out there that knows the answers to all these things. So kids, you know, it's good. Young people are learning about it and weighing in as well because it affects young people so much. Well, I appreciate you saying that Mary Beth and saying that about the ACLU. I also have to say uh, that we hear recognize the courage of our clients and our clients willingness to speak up and stand out and put their name on the they put their they're the ones with the names on the docket you know they uh, you and brandy you know you're the ones who are willing to say you know what this is not right and i can't just let this slide so we are always really grateful for the courage of our clients too so thank you all i really appreciate the time yeah great job thank you, thank you guys. Bye, everybody that's Brandy Levy, Mary Beth Tinker, and Vic Walchek talking about the case before the U.S. Supreme Court, BLV Mahanoy Area School District. You can find more information, including many legal documents, at aclupa.org slash bl. There is a link for a recording of the oral arguments in the show notes with National ACLU Legal Director David Cole presenting arguments on Brandy's behalf. That brings episode 59 to a close. The editor of Speaking Freely is Freddie Foulet. Our video editor is Cambria Lee. Our music is from bensound.com. The executive director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania is Reggie Schuford. I'm Andy Hoover. Until next time, be healthy and be free.